Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, to the second talk, we are giving this time on the subject of repressing dissent. Uh, I am meant to be arrested a few hours from now. To be precise, in seven hours at 9.30 a.m. Paris time, 6,000 kilometers from here. This arrest has been ordered by a French prosecutor who was directly nominated by the French president. Her name is Aline Ollier. She benefits from no autonomy from the political power, which has full control over her career, can sanction her or promote her discretionarily. This person spent most of her career as a juvenile judge and instructing judge in some of the smallest jurisdictions of France. As a lawyer, I've had to fight her since she was designed in January 2023 as the head of the AC2 section of Paris Prosecutor's Office in countless political cases, which she has systematically oriented or buried to favor the current power. How has this person with no credentials suddenly been propelled at one of the most powerful sections of the Office of the Prosecutor of Paris? The answer sits on a chair with two legs, courting and servility. This former judge, whom had never been a prosecutor, was recruited five years ago in the immediate office of the closest minister to Brigitte Macron. From there, as an advisor, she developed an intimate relationship with what French people call le Palais de l'Elysée, French presidency, gained the confidence of the Première Dame, and was thus promoted to the most sensitive position a prosecuted prosecutor could be confided with in France. Take a moment to think about that. A judge, theoretically independent, is recruited by a political figure whom becomes minister, introduces her to the president's wife, whom promotes her as one of the most powerful prosecutors of the country. Today, Madame Ollier oversees most of the political cases in Paris. She protects the powerful, prosecutes the weak, and scares the opponents. She has the power to send to trial, arrest, investigate, bug, search, interrogate with little to no jurisdictional control. Policemen she instructs have no choice but to obey her. They are required to be the soulless executors of her will. Hours from now, because she has decided to, I might become an international fugitive. Because a prosecutor who sold her soul to the current French president has decided to please him and his prime minister and have me arrested. To be more precise, she decided to order me to reach a specific police station where I'm meant to be arrested. This is smoother. It's better because it allows for power to avoid some of the scandal and arrest of a lawyer would inevitably generate. This also allows for keener manipulation. They know I'm here. They know I was meant to talk to you tonight. They know I won't be able to be there. They knew I wouldn't renunciate to this conference. They knew this would allow them to treat me as a fugitive and legitimate the launching of a powerful machine. How do I know they know? Because my lawyer called them to let them know I couldn't be there. And they answered cryptically, we know he's in the US. His Twitter account speaks for itself. What do they want me arrested for? a series of tweets, formally. In a sense, in political cases, legal institutions behave like secret services. They have their legal cover. It happens all the time. Julian Assange's cover was a false rape accusation that was only dropped when the US was ready to have him extradited. Usman Sonko, the main opposition leader in Senegal, was barred from participating in the current elections because of a defamation process. A series of tweets is, in this case, their legal cover. Reality is, of course, slightly different. I spent the last years accompanying some of the most powerful and important dissidents of our time. This has brought me as a lawyer to represent some of the most important opponents to French current authorities, more specifically, before becoming one myself. This has also brought me to face some of the direst destruction campaigns one could think of. 
Jean-Luc Mélenchon, Piotr Pavlensky, Maxime Nicole, Régis Portalaise, Alexandre Juvin Brunet, Stéphane Espic, Valérie Minet, Noël Dauphour, les grands frères, Ivan Goua, Olivier Goudet, Taïa Ben Abderrahman, etc. These names, these names might tell you nothing. These are people who have, each with different perspectives and ideas, been considered as a threat to the current power in France and dealt as enemies, prosecuted for political reasons. One was kidnapped in Qatar after having exposed the corruption of the owner of the main French soccer club, PSG. Another was arrested for a Facebook account post, for a Facebook post, sorry, in which she compared Emmanuel Macron to a trash bin. Another for demonstrating with his Alma's Matter uniform during the Yellow Vests. Another participated in the demonstrations that paralyzed Guadeloupe in 2021 and is prosecuted under anti-terrorist legislation. Another is yet to understand why he was deprived from his liberty so many times and arrested every time he tried to pacifically demonstrate. These are people I have won cases for, cases sometimes launched in Tweetu Personae by Emmanuel and Brigitte Macron themselves, the infamous prefect of Paris Didier Lallemand, the interior minister Gérald Darmanin, and many other members of this government. These people have had different for courses beforehand. Some have had been arrested, detained, prosecuted under direct instructions of those political actors. Some, as Stéphane Speak, for example, for doing something as blunt as taking a bath near the Fort de Brégançon, where the presidential couple was overstaying and filming, filming himself running jokes on them. I'll never forget the fearful stare of the judge whom, abiding to our legal arguments, had no choice but to acquit this bather. Her eyes would slowly run from her wrist to my direction without a single twinkling, a single look towards the prosecutor or anyone else in the room. She knew what she was doing. She knew her career was at stake for a bath and some jokes. This all brought me to take my share in this oppositional stand by publishing 11 books, some of them bestsellers, whom exposed the oligarchic functioning of what has now become a formal democracy and a real autocracy. I became an, author, an actor in the course of events that announced the fatal sleepover of France into an authoritarian regime. This experience was fomented and supported by years of fragmentation of this power, whom had tried several times to adopt me. I went from Yale, the International Criminal Court, the Foreign Affairs Ministry, to defend people like Usman Sonko, Kemi Seba, or Julian Assange. They, or opponents, had considered I had stolen their codes, that I was some kind of a traitor. The first years they behaved complacently. I would come back. It was just an escapade. But year passed, and our opposition got more intense. My former classmate, with whom I had been in school for 12 years, became an important minister and then prime minister. He devoted 10 out of the 15 first minutes of his first prime TV show to talk about me. They grew obsessed. In the meantime, I was following my own path, a path that would bring me to discover with Julian Assange what it meant to confront the most powerful empire ever. We were a dozen at most around him. We were openly and explicitly targeted by the CIA and considered as an enemy organization as priority as Al-Qaeda for having exposed the crimes committed by the United States forces in Afghanistan and Iraq. He now faces a 175 year sentence. When he got arrested, I tried to continue on his trail. I defended most of the figures of the Yellow Vests, most of the main Pan-African figures that were emerging, got arrested in Senegal, accused of more and more crimes, and started thinking every time I'd go to court, soon I'll be one of yours. As you might have understood now, the forthcoming expose relies on prima facie experience and has nothing to do with speculative theorization you might be used to hear from of. Most of the experience I'll share here is meant and due to be invisibilized in the public space and furthermore to be excluded from spaces like this one. Contemporary powers do not often, if not ever, directly expose themselves. Their repression takes multiple forms that rely on a more or less conscious of cooperation from society and that rely on this first principle, ensure your enemy is silenced and invisibilized without any trace, and only if you fail, act directly and explicitly upon them. Liberal democracies rely on the fabric of opinion. They try to guide you, they, they try to guide the thoughts of the people who will choose their representatives election. 
guide their thoughts, guide their thoughts and you will ensure the distribution of resources organized by electoral processes will go the right way. Thus, you will ensure your power, your power will remain. If you read about us, about any of the people I have mentioned on Wikipedia or other, you'll have the impression of facing monsters. Everything or almost everything written on them will push you to remain as far as possible or even to turn them into enemies. This is not an incident. This is not an accident. It's the fruit of carefully thought campaigns that rely on social engineering techniques, which foster mimetic feelings and cooperation to ensure the silent slaughter of dissenting opinions. Desire is the core of politics of societies, because it's the core of human life. Malcolm X, who has now its name on one of New York streets after having been one of the most vilified persons in American contemporary history had these two sentences that work as one. The first one is, only a fool would let his enemy teach his children. And the second, if you're not careful, the newspaper will have you hating the people you are being oppressed, who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. Why do, they, why do these two sentences work together? Because knowing who is your enemy is passing from being a fool to a sovereign. Because your enemy will do everything to deceive you and make sure you don't know if he's the oppressor or the oppressed. Power is not an autonomous star around which planets revolve. It is deeply dependent on society. Power is generated by society. One of its key instruments is thus secrecy, or at least discretion, in order to infiltrate societies and garner energy from it. The ability of power to form opinions, generate information, and cover up its deeds is crucial, because no power can stand behind each citizen to ensure they will behave as it fits them. The support generated around their decisions must appear spontaneous, so that they will be able to convince you that this consent is widely shared, so that people will start fearing not only for the use of force by the said power, but by society itself. So that people will start feel threatened in their social survival if they don't follow the track they have been assigned. And thus, obedience is self-generated. Fear of marginalization rules the world. And as we've become more and more exposed to the eyes of the others through the latest technological mutations, Power has intensified its use of alternate techniques of repression to ensure that a sufficiently strong feeling of confirmation will ensure that its dominance persists at all costs. In this sense, unlike what we might think, social networks have reduced the space offered to dissidents by creating a retic reticular control that only allows for the emergence of alternate powers, which is not the same of dissidents. Only him or her who has a clan who is susceptible to gather a wide support can survive today in these new political structures. Only him or her who meets a block of society who dissents by going against, by, who, who dissents by going, by following the wave of society will be able to survive. Him or, who, or her who dissents by trying to go against a wave generated by society will be crushed. What counterbalances this new phenomenon and explains the radical recompositions that scare so many of the actors of the current state of things is, of course, the reduction of intermediation, the possibility to make a statement with no filter, the possibility to be heard directly. This is no small advance for whom has read Chomsky or knows in first hand what it is to be dependent on third actors to convey a message whom has suffered from the unavoidable censorship and distortion journalism produces. But this method has its flaws. Him or her whom will try to be directly heard might only be if he or she masters the codes of the society it tries to speak to or is intermediated by someone who does. The wretched, I cite counted exceptions, the wretched of the art, of the art will only be able to follow like or retweet they won't be able to exist. All over the world, dissent is met with a wide array of repressive methods. 
from real bullets to repetitional attacks, passing by compromise, arbitrary arrests, judiciary harassment, and so forth. The most brut brutal of those methods is not always the one we could think of. As a life deprived of all meaning after a false accusation widely spread that destroys your intimacy and forbids you to have access to your professional career can be worse than a death sentence. Established powers rely on continuums of repression, which ideally flow and met and are met with little to no obstacles. For any contemporary power, avoiding this place of explicit violence is critical. Modern societies have built themselves on the illusion of consent, and thus against the counterexample of archaic repression that Foucault theorized, which allowed to compensate the lack of material resources devoted to governing societies by displays of violence. The development of means provided to, to governments to govern society has helped contemporary power to rely on preventive measures. The more and more prevalent and invisible surveillance system we're subjected to meant to nudge and prevent any kind of dissent is the epitomia of this functioning. It allows to nipping in the bud any kind of dissidence. It is no accident that smaller and developing powers structurally display more violence than established and grown ones. Judging those displays upon moral grounds is significant of a profound misunderstanding of political dynamics. A corrida used to stage the dominance of men on the mightiest of, the, of all animals in traditional societies might appear cruel. But how cruel is the normalization of billions of cows slaughter once this domination is des definitively established? Aztec bloody sacrifices descriptions by Hernán Cortés appeared horrendous to the European opinions. But how cruel was the genocide that immediately followed and that relied on the denouncing of this cruelty, whose objective, whose objective was to maintain at the smallest possible cost order in the huge Aztecan empire. One violence was over-visibilized. The others were for centuries perfectly invisibilized. Both managings of visibility serve the same goal, although with different methods, founding and maintaining fictions which would perpetuate those powers. A nation power will show cruelty to announce its advent and display it as long as it lacks of resources to maintain itself. Daesh, the Islamic Emirate, would throw homosexuals from high towers, execute hostages, and openly display forms of torture, not because it was evil per se, but because it was a new form of power that was setting itself on territories over which it felt the need to set examples, to produce more shifts and impose its authority over social structures at a fast path. Governing by example and cruelty is not systematically the most violent form of government, far, far from it. When Louis XV had Damien ripped apart in the public sphere, he perpetuated a vertical form of government to little to no cost, comparatively to the thousands of casualties the French Revolution would have to generate for its guillotine to install its dominance. And I'm discounting the millions of casualties revolutionary and Napoleonic wars would trigger. Yet one appeared barbaric and still appears barbaric to us, and the other modern. You could reverse the perspective and recall that one allowed for a feudal and lordly system to perpetuate itself, whilst the other allowed, formally speaking at least, for the political emancipa emancipation of millions, and thus considered that the violence triggered by the revolution was more legitimate than the one triggered by the French royalty. But at what cost? French Revolution gave birth to the first modern example of a political police, which has endured for 200 centuries, uh, 200 years, and offered France, including in its most vile, imperialistic, collaborative, or colonialist models, a, remarka a remarkable political stability, allowing it to commit many crimes. French Republic had to proceed to the mass repression of dissent. French royalty preferred to rely on carefully chosen individuals and events to maintain and perpetuate its authority. Of course, this doesn't signify that one model was morally superior to the other. And all the perspectives can always be reverted in politics. 
one could think intuitively, for example, that without the French Revolution, there would have there would have been no colonization. And be reminded that the abol abolition of slavery was much more intensely pushed for by the United Kingdom than by the ephemeral French Republic. But one could also argue that all these, including the development of surveillance societies, was the fruit of technological and, tech and capital transformations, and that the shifts of political regimes only accompanied these movements rather than determined them. Whichever the perspective, one understands that the repression of dissent might give indications on the nature of the regime, but not necessarily appear sufficient to provide with a moral judgment over it. Is the assassination of Navalny an important and defining event, more than the thousands of tens of thousands deaths that have triggered the last war? To judge upon that, your, your views on the importance of individualities in the course of historic events from a Hegelian, liberal, or Marxist perspective will have a crucial impact. The question of mass versus individuality can also be asked from a reverted perspective. If power, power, the dilemma between individual or mass repression and how both can be combined is crucial, for dissidents, the question of the socialization of the opposition effort or its concentration in one body can also be a crucial dilemma. Wikileaks, for example, was faced with this interrogation when Julian Assange was accused of rape. An internal movement very strongly pushed for him to renounce to his position and thus try to save the structure. Him, on the contrary, considered that the structure he had created was only an appendix of him, and as any structure, would deform itself to the point of rupture the moment he'd leave it and thus lose its soul, his soul, and become without any kind of interest or impact on the world. Thus, to save himself and to save the structure, Julian Assange decided to maintain the perfect couple that both had until then represented. The dilemma was profound and serious as Julian Assange had exceptionally managed to build a brand relying on a willing fool and calculate com calculated confusion with Wikipedia so quickly that it was possible to conceive that this brand could survive without him. He knew also nonetheless that concentrating all the risks, including legal ones in a sole vulnerable body, soon to be made homo sacer, to take the words of Giorgio Agamben, was maybe the only possibility to persevere in the radical scientific journalism path he had taken. In a few words, the idea of Julian Assange when he created WikiLeaks was very simple. Journalism, journalism per se was a corrupted uh, action because it, as any kind of intermediary, it produced, it produced effects of power. In another word, the idea for Julian was to give direct access to the citizens to the information produced by apparatus of power without any kind of filter in order to let them interpret themselves this information without having their own agenda or any kind of interpretative sublayer that they would have to follow. Julian Assange thus manipulated, in a sense, mainstream media with whom he partnered, he partnered at first by pushing them to provide him with visibility to the institution he directed, WikiLeaks, and in a second time, autonomized from them by publishing directly all the documents he had provided them first. Julian was also confident that the rape accusation he was facing would appear, would appear so egregious that it would promptly be swifted away. Remember that he was accused only a few weeks after having started his revelations on the Afghan logs and then the Iraq logs, and a few weeks before the revelation of the diplomatic cables that would trigger an immense scandal. Thus, there was this perspective that theoretically there would be some kind of natural distance regarding the credibility of those allegations that suddenly surfaced against him. He knew little then of the pernicious effects of those kinds of attacks when they're effectively handled by adversaries. Soon would he see himself excluded from all the platforms that, he, that had adopted him, albeit in a sense, as time would establish. Soon would he see himself so vulnerable and isolated that when the US decided to capture him years later to their UK allied, no force would rise, would rise to try to impeach it. 
Power knows that it will never exist per se, and that it will always be in need of society and society actors to act as, it main, as its main relays. Thus, it keeps on playing with it and then with them and any kind of social forces that could nurture it. In a sense, power is soulless and only believes in forces. On the other hand, citizens, and especially politically acti active citizens, are often blinded by their belief and their certainty that ideas rule the world and are not simple instruments to rule the world. As such, they often become the perfect agents, not for change, but for the perpetuation of systems of oppression. One who defies the state, like let's say Julian Assange, who turned his organization into a small sailing ship navigating in a sea of tankers and tried to defy those tankers, is necessarily exposed not only to power, but to social forces that will be instrumentalized by power to attack it and destroy it. Julian Assange decided to provide citizens not with ideology, but with weapons. Those weapons were real documents that were shared in order to provide with citizens with the capacity to defy the legitimacy of states, to expose their lies, and thus to gain sovereignty and independence. A dissident who does not seek for power and does, who does not accept to become the instrument of any power is doomed. In this sense, it appears to me important to differentiate the dissident from the opponent and the political opponent. Again, the example of Julian Assange was quite interesting on that matter. In order to survive, Julian tried to present himself to Australian elections, gathering only a few votes. Other cases of dissidents have been maybe more ambivalent. For example, Navalny did the exact inverted path, took, took the exact inverted path. He first tried to introduce himself in the political sphere, in far-right parties, and because he was expelled from it by the current system of power, he decided to become a dissident and to try to use truth as a tool to reopen the political path to enter into this system. Those switches should not bring us to confuse those two functions. What is extraordinarily interesting for me is that Julian Assange understood the dynamic, but at some point refused to actually fully involve itself with the consequences it, it would have had on the attempt he was producing, not only to explicit truth on certain facts and stages of history, but more broadly on what the, the nature of politics is. When I met Julian Assange in 2014, he was totally isolated by his rape accusations. His platform WikiLeaks had been destroyed, the organization he had founded was subject to a banking ban that would trigger an interesting effect because people started sending him uh, some data that at the time was worthless, which was called Bitcoin and would turn him into a millionaire a few years later. And human rights organizations and mainstream media despised him for his radicality. Only a tiny Latin American country, Ecuador, which was using him in a broader attempt to establish its position against the US in the frame of a conflict with Chevron, was standing by him. 2016 changed the situation. Julian Assange had managed to reestablish the platform of submission of WikiLeaks and made him a potential political actor. His revelations on the DNC and Clinton's foundation donations triggered a political earthquake that was aggravated by the hysteria of the US mainstream media. Obama, in his last press conference at the White House in January 2017, would rightly, criticize, would rightly criticize the later, the mainstream press, for having transformed the revelations of WikiLeaks, which he deemed to be legitimate, into a political tool. At that stage, many thought Julian Assange had been bought off, whether by the Russians, Trump, or others. Trump himself didn't help by thanking publicly the organization. 
Thus, there was a legitimate hope that the persecution of Assange, who had been imprisoned for six years in 20 square meters in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, would soon come to an end. This was an interesting situation. In other words, the perception that Julian was finally accepting to become a political actor and no longer a dissident was naturally accompanied by the, by the perception his fate would soon improve. In other words, there seemed to have a collective, a collective consciousness that if you are an homo sacker, if you are someone who's deprived from any protection by the state, you are doomed. And if, the, on the contrary, you start participating in, again in political proceedings, you will be protected from all. This shows, if needed, and this is a crucial lesson you should remember, that law is nothing else than an instrument of politics. But Julian was a dissident by nature. And when he was given the opportunity in February 2017, a few weeks only into Trump's mandate, to make, to make accessible to the general public the CIA's hacking library, thus deactivating it, he didn't hesitate. What immediately followed is interesting and was uncovered years later by a deep investigation published by senior reporter Zach Dorfman and two acolytes published on Yale News. After interviewing more than 30 CIA operati operatives and White House employees, they discovered that Mike, Mike Pompeo, then director of the CIA, had immediately rushed to the Oval Office to meet Trump and tell him that basically it was either Julian Assange or his own fate that was at stake, that his agency was basically asking him to have Assange head, because of course the consequences of the revelations of WikiLeaks were huge. The capacity for CIA to actually spy on what it considered its enemies had been reduced to almost zero in what regards the digital world, because of course, when you make public the tool that is used by a secret agency to hack into a computer, you reveal the zero day exploit that they're using. And therefore you allow for the software fabricant to correct the zero day and to close the door the agency was using. So the consequences were, of course, important. And as you imagine, someone like Julian Assange knew perfectly what he was doing. So basically, CIA wasn't very happy. And they were asking Mike Pompeo for a reaction. And they were asking him for a strong, a strong reaction, especially since they considered that there might have been some complicity between the Republicans and Julian Assange because of what had happened during the campaign. So, of course, Trump and Pompeo were embarrassed because on one side, they had thanked publicly WikiLeaks and they had made sure that their bases, their electoral bases would love WikiLeaks. And on the other, they had the CIA telling them either you do something or we do something. So they started discussing. And they started discussing of several plans that the CIA, CIA had elaborated that went from an attempt to extradite Julian, which was, of course, the nicest, to simply assassinate him. In between, there were a lot of intermediary plans, like, of course, kidnapping, trying to trigger a shootout in the streets of London to, and to hide an undercover operation and so forth. The CIA soon decided to establish a small team that was sent to Europe to, and also to Ecuador to make sure that whatever happened, WikiLeaks would be definitively deactivated. So started, starting in February 2017, we started feeling some weird things in our environment, including in our intimacy. We didn't know yet what was happening exactly. We didn't have access to the action of this apparatus of surveillance. And this is maybe one of the most important tools for states in order to repress dissidents is, of course, the asymmetry in terms of accessibility to the truth the capacity to know whether you are not surveilled, the capacity to know whether or not you are exposed, the capacity to know whether or not you will be able to act without facing sanctions or worst. 
So for a few years, we lived with this uncertainty, yet with the feeling that something was happening and that we were being exposed to something we couldn't determine. In this sense, the revelations by this outlet were critical for us to be able to reconstruct what had happened into our lives, including our non-political lives, and understand how we had been targeted and why. The images that might have been shown or not regarding the surveillance uh, that we were exposed were from cameras that were planted all over the Ecuadorian embassy in London, which were used to surveil our conversations with Julian Assange in all possibilities, in all, sorry, in, in all circumstances. They were accompanied by, th there are thousands of hours of the surveillance. They were accompanied by techniques such as infra, um, infrared uh, cameras, uh, sound microphones that would rely on the vibrations that were on the windows that were happening in the glass of the windows that would allow to capture the sound even though the, the mic was from Syria and so forth. Of course, they would be accompanied by what in French you call opération d'entrave, which are attempts to destabilize the people you're surveilling without giving any notification of whom and why it happens. Those techniques which are widely used, and Edward Snowden described them from when he was working for the CIA in Geneva, uh, are meant to destroy the intimacy of political opponents and dissidents and make sure they won't be able to keep on gathering individuals around them and will start focusing on defending themselves rather, rather than defending the ideas they're fighting for. A dissident is a homo sacer, therefore someone against whom everything is allowed. The only limitation is the public support he or her disposes of and the capacity for the public to unveil the operations purported against him. In other words, the only limitation to destroying him are the risks to attain to the belief of the public that norms exist and that a political system is something else than a balanced system of oppression, relying not on abstract rules that protect all, but on the belong belonging of each to a more or less powerful community that might challenge the power that is protecting you. In this sense, I do not believe that there is a difference in nature between regi political regimes and whether you live in an authoritarian state or in a liberal democracy is all a question of appearances and fiction and capacity for the power to fabricate consent and make sure it will not have to use explicit violence to make you abide to his decisions and the system it has created. So these were general thoughts. And now I will, I will, I will go to a much more critical and maybe destabilizing and disturbing uh, analysis which regards some of the tools that are used to repress dissent in contemporary world, and especially in, demo in liberal democracies. So I'll start maybe by the more difficult, which is the technique that first allowed for the dismantling of the natural protection we all rely on as citizens, which allows us to have a specific space that is theoretically completely protected from the intromission of the state, which we qualify in the Western world as intimacy. And that was used in the case of Julian Assange and maybe others. This technique, and I want to address it because I think it's very important for us to reflect on how progressive movements and what appear to be social advances can be used against political opponents and more broadly against the reduction of inequalities and the fight against systems of oppression. So this was, of course, the question of a false rape accusation. False rape accusations have, in a stunningly apparent paradox, become one of the most privileged instruments to silently to silent politically and politically repress progressive movements and figures. The, weapon, the weaponization of advances permitted by feminist movements have created in modern liberal societies an apparently unsolvable dilemma for forces that have accompanied 
those progresses, but by doing so, have also accompanied the expansion of states' intromission into the sphere of intimacy in the name of progress, thus a willingly or not offering it a spectacular opportunity to destabilize structural opposition forces. Paradoxically, the gravest of all crimes, according to me, is in its contemporary definition, an act that can be produced without a trace, happening between two individuals who are the sole witnesses of what has happened. As a consequence, almost ontologically, no one is protected from a false accusation, or people are less and less protected from a false accusation as it tends to become an evidence lacking crime in certain societies. Unlike assassination, rape often does not need a body, and we're yet to prove from a judicial basis not only what a wrecked soul is, but further the causality link that has brought to wrecking that soul. In a patriarchal system in which the exploitation of women's bodies, but also asymmetries of resources, allow for their manipulation and weaponization, feminist movements very soon understood this problematic and started elaborating anti-carceral and communitarian logics to sanction and repress sexual violences, whilst avoiding that their battles would be used against their initial causes. This, interse this intersectional feminism, incarnated by many, including Angela Davis, had in, memory, had in memory how fighting against sexual violence had been used to destroy many of their brothers and sisters, including the Black Panthers. It is difficult to assess how this memory and has been lost and why it has been lost. What we can be confronted to is to an increase of the destruction of several opponents. Some of them I have had to defend, like Guzman Sonko, through the apparent, apparent expansion of a greater good, which is the protection of the vulnerability of bodies, whether they're women or men's bodies, in order to put aside sexual violence. Understanding why it has happened and how we can fight against it is crucial if, in order to protect those advances. Of course, one of the preconditions, preconditions to allow for this weaponization is the lack, is ensuring the lack of real independence of jurisdictions, which will be able to distort facts and use those accusations against dissidents, even though they lack of any substance. But the second one, which is more interesting to us because we cannot do much against this kind of manipulations of judicial powers, is the weakening of, princip of, principles, of basic principles of law, which we have been consciously or not pushing for. Justice in its contemporary form can only rely on evidence as it is being more and more requested to penetrate into the intimacy of others, it has started to accept less and less hard evidence and to rely, rely more and more on hearsay, hearsay and subjective appreciations, for example, from experts, transforming in-rem proceedings in in-person proceedings, relying also on monitors and other inquisitional techniques which have triggered a rupture with the ju judiciary principles adopted in the modern era. You have to take into account that taking into consideration hearsay, for example, in the frame of a jurisdictional proceeding necessarily politicized justice. Why? Because rumor is per se political, and what is expressed in the public sphere is not the natural spontaneous projection of, of reality, but of power relations, which fabricate consent to power. Using hearsay also creates a circular functioning, which soon brings societies from rational to rational functioning. A false accusation nourishing in a mimetic system, other false, false accusations. The risk in these circumstances of instrumentalization of justice is very important. It's, it is exactly the same system, paradoxically, that brought to witch hunts, but also more contentiously 
Inquisition trials like the ones of Gilles de Rais, which has turned to become known as Bluebird, allowing for the burning of thousands of individuals solely based on hearsay that would nourish itself successively, and that would be, of course, reliant on the instrumentalization of manipulation of people who were belonging to the more exploited categories of society. Whomever thinks this kind of proceedings and references is a thing from the past should take a look at the most recent display of this kind of social behavior. In France, in the verge of the 2020s, more than a thousand people filed criminal complaints all over the territory after having been pricked by unknown aggressors who use syringes to inject them an unknown content. More than a thousand criminal complaints were filed. The situation got so worrying that special police and justice means were deployed to identify the authors, the mechanisms, understand where these aggressions came from. <coughs> Medical tests were performed, special brigades were deployed and so forth. This lasted for a couple of years. After some time, it was definitively established that was what had happened was nothing more than a moral panic which had similarly emerged 150 years before. No actual victim was ever found, no author identified, no product ever injected, no syringe ever used. As I was saying, rape is the worst crime a human being can ever commit. Making it easy for someone to be accused without evidence, hard evidence, over the commission of this rape can trigger very important political risks, including for the victims. Turning back to the Middle Ages, unlike what is commonly thought, it was common for rape to be treated as the crimes of the crimes. It was given judiciary important consideration. Trials were organized in a very lengthy manner to try to establish the truth. But, what, but the, the counter element to this consideration and the condition it was given to was a very high sanction to those who would make false accusations. If after the trial, the person who had been accused was acquitted, the person whom accused him faced the equivalent sentence. In other words, death. This, in a patriarchal society where honor was a crucial question, was meant to allow for a self-regulation, dissuading anyone who didn't have a strong case to launch itself into accusations which would necessarily have dire consequences, whichever the verdict. It had also a secondary objective, which was to preserve the power of the stigma and its symbolic effect. Of course, this is not a solution for the modern times. But maybe today society has unbalanced her path in such a way that false accusations have literally lacked of any sanction, triggering with other factors, the instrumentalization we were talking about. For different reasons, political actors can survive this kind of offensive. We are seeing it, whether they're true or wrong accusations, they can use their political capital to avoid any discussion on the fact or if there is any discussion, a discussion to convince a sufficient majority of people to actually keep on following them and preserve them from any consequences. Dissidents do not have that privilege. Dissidents, by nature, are people who are not trying to gather a following. Thus, there are people that are completely unprotected from offensives that can be started from the state. And thus, there are people for whom the enunciation of the truth might be very difficult to be widespread and therefore to be able to survive the current stigma. The terrifying idea of a society in which hearsay would replace proof is more broadly a problematic for dissidents, but also for political opponents in this case as these people are structurally in an asymmetric position towards powers. 
and that powers do not satisfy, satisfy themselves with occupying one of the four branches that composed it in modern societies. Executive and parliamentary powers have in our oligarchic societies strong ties with media corporations, which often, it's the case in France, belong to indus industrials whose resources depend on their relations with politicians. This circular system, the most legal of all corruptions in liberal democracies, bring media to be the servants of a mutual understanding functioning in which their owners favor candidates and destroy opponents in order to gain favors from the owners of positions of government. Favors which will allow them to accumulate resources, which will allow them in turn to finance the media they will use to reinforce their influence and protect themselves and reach perfect impunity. This system, which aims at conforming opinions, allows for a progressive monstrification of opponents and dissidents, which of course influences courts and makes them more vulnerable to their reign. I remember the first time I met Julian Assange, I was very surprised by how human he was. I had been reading portrayals of him describing him as an egocentric, lunatic, and extremely arrogant person. I was waiting for him in the Ecuadorian embassy, and I mean, I was surprised by other things first. I mean, he's an Australian, so it's very big and strong, which was unexpected. And he was sleeping uh, on the floor without, without shoes, so appeared like a phantomatic presence. But what, what surprised me soon is that he, he spent the first two hours without actually saying a word about himself. I was coming back from Central African Republic where a civil war was ongoing and where I had gone for my PhD. And he literally spent 45 minutes asking me questions about this country in the world, which nobody cared of at the time. Before, and we, when we asked how, him how he was, he went to take a box without answering. He was, he, he was having this very soft tone and, and very, very intense look. And so he, he, he got up, he went to take a box and started showing us some weird elements. First, first a teeth. A tooth, sorry, tooth, 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 tooth. Then uh, some some hair. Then a lunatic drawing. It was all the weirdest stuff he had been receiving by fans all over the world. So it was his way to say that he was actually still supported even by weirdos, and that he was very happy from that. And so he had this very strange way of communicating with the others, but which was exactly the opposite of how he had been described and how. He had been vilified by, by, by the media. So, uh, of course, destruction, reputational, rep, rep, reputational destruction is critical because it has enough. It creates an autotelic functioning. The more you're vilified, was I cut off? No. The more you're vilified, the more chances you will have of being suspected and prosecuted for any kind of crime, and the more chances you will have of being brought to court, and the more chances you will have to be condemned, and so forth. So as we know, justice is not a system of establishment of truth, but rather a subjective system of appreciation of your capacity to conform yourself to the, the society you're in. And in a sense, it allows for a destruction of opponents that doesn't need to pass by through direct political interventions into the judicial system. The judicial system, through this uh, destruction and attacks of reputational attacks become the sandbox, the sandbox for social dynamics, parent social dynamics, which are fabricated by power and are the result of pure political plays. Those dynamics play in many platforms and many dimensions. I, I'd like to, to, to contribute, to give a few words about one of them, Wikipedia, which is, again, a theoretically very positive and progressist system, a collaborative structure, which self-regulates itself by relying on strong rules and a community who praises itself for its high standards. Reality, of course, is quite different. Once you open without any kind of control or almost and for free access to any kind of contributors to participate in fabricating a platform, you will naturally reproduce the relations of power that exist in reality and thus favor the most powerful. Most of the interesting content in Wikipedia was simply pillaged by paying encyclopedias, which were nourished by scientific and paid contributors at the time. 
those institutions relying on solid rock standards have slowly but surely been wiped out of the earth of the earth after this free competitor arrived. Since then, Wikipedia has had to rely on itself and to stand alone. Thus, on most contemporary subjects, it presents some flaws. It needs one, one of the reasons of those structural flaws is the fact that Wikipedia relies on sources which are almost systematically derived from, from what they consider legitimate secondary sources. In other words, mainstream media. More punctually, you can use books, which are of difficult handling on the encyclopedia and a source of naturally bound to all kinds of manipulations since it's impossible for other contributors to check most of the time what is actually said on the book you're using as a source. Anyone who confronts a dominant structure of power will get his share of false accusations, defamation, and operations from mainstream media. That gets mainstream media that get most of their financing from the apparatus of powers that you will be defying. Thus, Wikipedia very often appears as a soundbox for those accusations, giving them legitimacy that they lacked when they were produced in media that people know to be either orientated, either simply corrupt. By appearing as an encyclopedia, they managed to create an institutional appearance that allows for verification of the dissidents and on the other hand, to support the powers in place. This, of course, dynamic, which is natural, is reinforced by several factors. One of them is the fact that the campaigns against dissidents and so forth are reverberated by thousands of structures working for big corporations or states who have the means to finance them to actually destroy whom opposes them. This is not the case in general when you're a dissident, unless you're supported by another state actor, which happens to be the case of many dissidents in, uh, in countries that are not uh, akin to the interest of the United States. If you are, in a sense, a true dissident, you will be alone. You will be left alone with your political force eventually that supports you, but often when you're a dissident, you're not trying to structure a political force. And thus, you will have no one to relay your claims and no one to actually balance the violence that will be applied to you by all these actors who are basically paid to destroy you. This is the first wave and the first factor that will amplify these dynamics that Wikipedia naturally hosts. The second is simply that most of genuine, most of Wikipedia contributors are genuine citizens that believe what they read. And they will naturally themselves, because of their lack of formation, of political formation, experience, and history, will simply take as granted what is written in X or Y media outlet and try to provide it with some visibility. Why is this important? Because one of the ways you have when you're a national or local dissident to actually pass over the blockade that the powers you're opposing try to impose on you is to reach either foreign actors, either extra local actors. And those actors, most of the time, will simply go to Wikipedia to know who you are and will tell themselves, whoa, this person is weird, in the best case, and will tell themselves, OK, no, let's put him aside. Why? Because you've been vil vilified by structures of power you've been opposing, which themselves have managed to either finance directly or indirectly ma medias that will purport these accusations and so forth. This is the case also for genuine journalists from other countries that will decide on whether to invite you, whether to take into account your opinion based on what has been said about you before and what is the best place to know what has been said about you. It's not to read the 10, 100,000 articles that might exist on you and counter contents and so forth. It's simply to go to Wikipedia. So the simple dissident will always be crushed in this dynamic. We could add a new layer even to make it worse. Reputational, reputational attacks destabilize the life, whether private or social or professional, and intimacy of those dissidents. This will expose them to marginalization and isolation, which will bring them to take more and more risks, which will then bring them to be more and more exposed to traps, 
or also simply to making mistakes. And thus you have another layer that will explain why most of these incidents are progressively set aside. I'll briefly go over another kind of um, leg legislative, legislative advancement that appears to be positive and has been weaponized against the most frail of society in society. So I will focus for this in France. Harassment, although it is today considered as a perfectly natural offense, is of very recent creation. France progressively adopted legislative measures to criminalize it in the 90s. As with the recent evolutions on the other questions we have been dealt, I'm pretty sure that technological mutations have played a crucial role in the advent of this notion and the insertion of states into social relationships. The possibility to objectivize situations that until, there were, until then were impossible to establish because they were lacking of any traces is now possible. Phone and written conversation, recordings, and so forth allow you to prove, to provide evidence of, of harassment. This has allowed for an expansion of the state way beyond the actual situation it was actually initially taken care of. Beforehand, social relationships and the asymmetry of social relationships and the way that the fact that you would wait and use your social weight or capital culture, cultural capital and so forth to actually gain advantages or destroy the life of someone was compensated by mechanisms of auto-regulation by society. Again, technological advances allow for state to step in and to replace society and these auto-regulating mechanisms. By creating a false feeling of omniscience, those technological um, mutations, sorry, have pushed the legislator to penetrate those new spaces and try to moralize them by evicting these horizontal forms of violence which, and counter-violence, which were perceived to be unavoidable until then, and replace them by a vertical control through criminal law. So we started with harassment, and soon in 2018, uh, Emmanuel Macron, the current president, and his minister, Marlene Schiappa, decided that it was important to extend that to cyber harassment. Cyber, cyber harassment. So not only harassment in real life, but also virtual harassment. So they adopted a law in 2018 that was to be to sanction any kind of message that you would post on a social network that would have as, as an effect or as an objective to hinder the quality of life of the person that would be the subject of this message. Normally, harassment implies repetition. You have to have to act several times in order to become a harasser. That's the definition of harassment. In this circumstance, it was decided that even only one message would be sufficient to constitute harassment if it was included in a more collective effort to actually um, hinder the quality of life of the person who was targeted. How was this reform solved? Of course, the idea was let's protect the poor 13, 14 years old ch children that are being harassed in school through Instagram, social networks, and so forth. This was theoretically the primary objective. But wait, if the only condition for you to criminalize someone, to arrest him and so forth, is the fact that you have sent a message, that you have published a message, not even sent to him, just published a message, let's say on Twitter, that can have as a consequence or solely objective to hinder his quality of life, what can happen? You start repressing any kind of dissenting opinions. Let's say you have a political actor who's accused of corruption by a mainstream media. As a citizen, you're on Twitter and you decide to react to that. You say, oh, what an asshole or whatever. You, you post it on Twitter and you name him. Well, you can be prosecutor on, prosecuted under that law. And so I don't, think, I don't think it's a misconception. I think it's meant to be that way. And why do I think that? Because I've, I found myself to be defending people who actually did that and who were, who were arrested at 6 a.m. at their parents' place, brought to the police station, and then judged and condemned 
because they had published one message mentioning one person on Twitter who was a public figure. And this law has basically never been used to protect any kind of weak people. They've only been used to protect powerful people who are trying to protect themselves from opinions that they consider are hindering their quality of life, because it's not nice to say of someone that he's a corrupt person. And you can go tomorrow to a to, a, to your doctor and say, can you, I, I'm not feeling well because someone has said I was corrupt. And question of truth is evacuated. Whether it's true or not doesn't count anymore. You can be condemned for having hindered his quality of life. So you see for something that actually should be unquestionable, you immediately or you very soon find yourself, and it's been very difficult to explain in France as a lawyer, that my clients were just normal people that express their opinion. Very often, I must admit, in a vulgar way, trying to use uh, Twitter as if they were you know, talking with a bartender or whatever, thus not very de delicately, but still simply expressing an opinion and found themselves arrested and violently oppressed by states because of this action. I tried to bring, to bring the, the question to the Constitutional Council by telling them, look, massification of opinions is a key in liberal democracies, whether through vote, whether through demonstrations, whether through publication. It's the only way for citizens to try to compensate the asymmetry of power and to protect themselves from the abuses of power. Thus, you're criminalizing the very mechanism that allows for liberal democracies to actually try to be, in a sense, democracies. In other words, to be part of, I mean, to have part of the power go to the people. I was really treated as a lunatic. I think time will say, but for now, yeah, it's been very complicated. So why do I use these two examples? The first being very dedicated, the second seemingly more fun, but I can assure you that when you are a 25 years old guy that gets suddenly arrested in your small village uh, in the north of France by anti-terrorists, Brigades, because they send you a hardcore uh, and bring to brought to a to a police station for forty eight hours and then convoked to be judged and treated as a criminal and being condemned to a year of prison uh, for 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 a tweet. I mean, it it becomes serious. Why do I use these two cases amongst maybe others? Because, as I was saying in the beginning, we tend we when we implicate ourselves in political struggles to believe that we're part of something which is a greater good and that we're defending a greater good and thus not think of the consequences this implication can have and how we can be instrumentalized because of our naivety. How can we protect ourselves from these kinds of mechanisms? I think the first one is by not putting ourselves in the hands of the enemy, in a sense, paraphrasing Malcolm X. States are naturally a repressive structure and thinking that the expansion of the of the state and the reachability of the state over our lives can serve a greater good can be a huge mistake. All the tools I mentioned and many others I didn't rely on our naivete or genuineness. A genuineness that I think the fall of the USSR, which was the last important structure of power that nourished and financed dissidents in our world, has nourished. Why? Because it has wiped out decades of building and transmission of alternative political thought that was built by people who lived in societies in which they were minoritarian and thus learned upon the limits and had a, a, of state domination and developed naturally a very critical thought about it. Entertainment industries make sure that we have our brains saturated with useless information that distracts us from the learning and sharing and reproducing of centuries of accumulated experience and knowledge risen from resistance struggles. The devaluation of knowledge and the constant stream of information have become the most powerful instruments of power of our dominance. In my opinion, knowledge distinguishes itself from information in the sense it integrates it in a structure of thought, which shapes a vision of the world rather than simply transforming you in a consuming monkey. Many of our mistakes, most of the violence generated in the world is the fruit of is the fruit of ignorance and of genuine belief in ideas that are introduced to us as serving a greater good. Violent repression only intervenes when apparatus of power failed to 
perpetuate this belief and thus to manipulate us into obeying them without resistance. Violence is the last resort technique of a much wider array that silently destroys lives and societies. Whom of you knew that the famous bluebird legend was aroused from the burning of an innocent man for political reasons? Again, our genuine belief that ideas rule the world when they're an instrument to ruling the world, I think is maybe the most critical element we should detach ourselves from. And I think that Julian Assange had understood that intuitively or not by trying to give us direct access to elements that would be able to shape our knowledge without trying to himself become a power shaping our perception of the world by imposing ourselves a kind of knowledge. Thank you. If you have questions, I'd be very glad to answer them or try. No one. Um, do you think so? You talk about like justice and like politicization of justice, but like, do you think that there's still a mode to use justice for the benefit of the, of the population? I think it's a it's a it's a very mistaken thought that we might have, and uh, that arises from the lack of experience of personal experience with judicial systems. And I think that criminal lawyers, who have a minimum of political thought, very soon realize that they're being instruments of this illusion. They're actually nourishing this illusion, and that they should actually quit their job, but often they can't for for different different reasons. So. Justice becomes a tool to advance and try to create progress when it is instrumentalized by a, a social power inside society, which is defending your ideas. But justice per se remains an instrument. And I mean, that, that will be used either by your side or the opposite side in order to have their cause advanced. But per se, justice will never be something that will trigger advance because it will always be dysfunctional for a thousand reasons. For example, I mean, what, one of the thing, one of the arguments I did not make regarding what is actually structural criticism of the ju judiciarization of the fight against sexual violence is the fact that it is completely enabled to actually address the issues that this violence is created for the victim, and on the contrary, most often creates re-traumatization because it's a blind system that comes and basically destroys the lives of everyone at the same time. I haven't seen much victims actually relieved in the long term by the judiciarization of the system. They are relieved by the fact of feeling heard and feeling recognized. But there, there are thousands of mechanisms that we can put in place to actually trigger this relief and actually trigger this recognition. So I do believe that justice especially criminal justice, is, is a tool that we should be very fearful of in any kind, especially, again, because it's so easily instrumentalized and manipulated by current powers to actually push them in one direction and not to actually help victims and reestablish any kind of sense of justice as a concept, as a concept, not as an institution. Yeah, I think as you rated very well, media is extremely powerful and shape of people's opinion. And collaborating with their opinions. But I think it becomes a very big problem to be very part of these systems that are so funded by the same people that become kind of oligarchical. So, what is the alternative to this media? Is there actually like a possibility of completely decentralized and democratized media? So, I mean, that was the fantasy and fiction that maybe Julian Assange and WikiLeaks early believed in which was, okay, we just won't need intermediation. We'll just give direct access and so forth. But what we have seen, of course, I mean, you have two ways of interpreting what has happened afterwards. One, which is the most critical, is you see how all this information have been used to actually either bully people, either try to, 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 to create uh, hysterical uh, reactions in social sphere. I mean, all kinds of things like the pizza gate, blah, 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 et cetera. And then you tell yourselves, okay, we should never let informa raw information in the hands of people because not only, it's not that people do 
uh, anything with them. It's rather that immediately powers constitute themselves within people to actually try to use this information to influence other peoples and to gather power and so forth. I mean, if you follow this logic, information will never be disconnected from power and in any kind you will always be in a kind of a distorted functioning that can be corrected as much as possible by trying to, for example, to, to I mean, I, I'm French, so for example, so socializing media by making of any citizen an actionnaire, a shareholder of the media and, and giving the belonging of those media to citizens directly, I find it a good solution when you fill your tax paying form, you say, I want to give X money to whatever media, or I want to be participating in this kind of media. You can try to think of in an anarchical way like that. But the other way of seeing things regarding what has happened with WikiLeaks in particular, is that people were simply trying, I mean, learning to be independent, learning to deal by themselves with the raw information, process it. And so they had this phase in which they would basically believe anything they were told. And then they had this, this phase in which they were simply self-educating themselves to filter the information and understand that they had to verify it and they shouldn't just uh, take as granted what was shared on this Telegram post or in this, uh, in, on, on this Facebook account and try to go to the source of what was pretendly quoted and make sure that it existed. And if you have a system in which all of the information that is published uh, if, if there is systematically an open source to it, connected to it, I mean, you allow for this kind of automatic self-learning, which allows you to be less and less dependent from state structures. So, I mean, it's a question of perception. Maybe it's a mix of both. Maybe, maybe there is, maybe the reality is in, in between. Maybe we'll always need, need regulating systems. But maybe there is something true that in the long term, with a, after catastrophes, will allow us to actually get into a much better society. Can you develop on automated self-learning? Because there is the risk that if you rely simply on self-learning, people will just be able to make their opinions because you were highly critical on uh, mainstream media, which is fair, but at the same time, mainstream media are specialists of finding nuances and uh, providing the most balanced information. So, uh, uh, maybe automated self-learning basically works, I think, as, I mean, not technically, of course, but as society does, which means that, I mean, we learn by mimetism, no? Like babies mimet imitate what they see and imitate the language they hear and progressively they... And then in the second hand, you bring them, you, you provide them with the, with the rules and with the abstraction that is behind language. That's when they learn to write and so forth. No, you, you give them with the, with the underlying rules that actually direct this language. But so in that sense, I mean, machines are bound to, to commit the same mistakes that we do, that we commit, which is simply to actually repeat trying to nuance, but still repeat what they read and ingest it. And most of the content ingested by these new platforms is what has been fabricated by structures of power. Hence the impossible dilemma that they keep on being, I mean, you've seen the last Google difficulties, know that, I mean, they were so much trying to balance the, the uh, bias uh, that they ended up creating black Hitlers and, and Napoleons because, I mean, that was a way to, 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 I mean, to, to, to compensate the lack of representation of, of black people. So, I mean, there's no solution, no? You will always be going too far and too, and I mean, the solution would be similar to what WikiLeaks and the open source community in general defends, it's simply giving access to the raw core source of those softwares and allow for people to control how they're built and try to make them better. But again, you will have the same problem than with, with Wikipedia. I mean, of course, those who have much more money to invest will be able to control it more and so forth. The difference is that with this kind of software, you can appropriate themselves and extract them from the public sphere and make them your own tool. You no, know? so isolate them from the, from the structures of power and use them in a, in a smaller community and thus uh, make them more efficient. I, but yeah, so maybe maybe it would be a better solution in that direction. 
Um, as a question that's maybe slightly off the subject, and if you don't mind, please, I would like to ask you this question in English and in French because it's very important to my countrymen. I am from Senegal. So today, uh, we're going to get into French again. We uh, announced that people request lawmakers to consider passing an amnesty bill. There have been been killed, as you already know, more than 2,000 in prison and hundreds tortured and injured. That being said, if or when this bill passes, does that mean that there will be no prosecution even by the International Criminal Court? And can you shed light on uh, that? So I will just go ahead and say it in French. Ma cousine dit qu'il va amnistier ce qui n'est pas un souhait, mais c'est un ordre qu'il donne aux députés de sa majorité. Et il engage les députés de l'opposition à voter cette loi. Ils font certainement à ses alliés du PDS. Pouvez-vous nous éclairer par rapport à ça? Aussi, euh, cela veut-il dire qu'il n'y aura plus aucune poursuite possible, même avec la CP? So I, I'll, I'll answer only in English, if, you, if, you, if you're okay. Yes, uh, um, No, so amnesty laws, national amnesty laws have no impact in, on international criminal court. So there is no possibility to have uh, any kind of impunity at that level. I mean, the only way to have impunity is to basically bargain powers in order to make sure that the institution will never act. And because the prosecutor has a discretionary power, if he's well enough influenced, as we are seeing now in, on Palestine, for example, he will not act, even though there is evidences of crime. So I guess what Maki Sal is trying to do is have a double strategy, no? So internally, trying to make sure that there will be impunity, but w w why is he trying to get impunity in internally? I, I'm not even sure it's for him. I think it's more to make sure that the system will remain and that there will be no um, dissent that will rise, including from the armed forces, and that they will keep on abiding by the orders he has given, which are to uh, shoot at unarmed demonstrators and kill them to try to dissuade them to to defend the constitution and their rights. So this is the first stage. And he's doing that, and in parallel, doing all these efforts and all these dialogue national and so forth to convince the international community that they should understand that he's a Democrat, that he was forced by the circumstances to shoot on people, to order his armed force to shoot on people, but he's basically a good guy, and that therefore he shouldn't be prosecuted at the International Criminal Court. And because the International Criminal Court prosecutors budget is voted annually by the states, basically states direct what the prosecutor does. So if they tell the prosecutor, do not go that way, he will very probably abide and not go that way. So that's the calculus, in my opinion, from, from Akisal today. <clears throat> he should not forget that we have launched investigations, I mean, proceedings in France, in Spain, we might in other countries. And that in any case, uh, the force of the Senegalese people will prevail. And that if he has bought some time now with his discourses, if there is no immediate measures that come, well, he will probably have to face consequences. And he should be reminded that a lot of dictators have not ended up being judged, but by but simply hanged or lapidated by their own people. You know, everyone, sorry, English. I get a question for Senegal. Um, how do you feel now? What you can't say because. Uh, they are going to tie it to the Prime Minister now. So it's a personal question. We don't have to explain that on public space, but as a human being, not just how you feel right now in the house life. And <laughs> what you can say like what is I remember when I was 16, I convinced myself not to get into politics ever because I didn't want to have people like Gabriel Attal in my life, like for, for the rest of my life. And 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 Gabriel at the same time was posing with a Photoshop picture of, of Georges Pompidou, former president, with his face on the on, on, on the picture. So 15 years later, he's prime minister. Uh, and they want to arrest me, so it's kind of coherent. But uh, 
the, the yeah, I mean, I'm not. I, I I've been delusion long time ago. Gabriel is not delusioning me. I'm 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 kind of happy for himself because he's finding his I guess his equilibrium in in what he does. Uh, I know those people well enough to know that they're very sad and 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 they have an exciting lives and um, they might be happy to to be dining in 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 landed palaces and and to to buy. Uh, I mean, to, and to get food from from paid by the state, but I mean, more generally, I wouldn't be happy to to do what they do. So, I feel kind of okay with that. What I and I actually feel good because I have no kind of frustration or desire towards them. Which is, I mean, for someone who who's been raised in the Parisian elites, blah blah blah. I mean, I could have some kind of of, of feeling bad towards that. So it's not the case. What I what I am is very worried. Uh, for what will happen, but for my country, not not to, because I, I I know these people. I know they have no, I mean they're pure cynical people. But I mean you can be cynical and have a vision for your country or for humanity and so forth. I mean this, there is none of that. It's pure pillaging, and the consequences will be very 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 tough for for everyone. So I, I was, of course, I mean I'm a human being, so I was very excited. To see that what I had announced in Crepuscule five years before was confirmed. It was also revenge on all these accusations I had received at the time. But on the other hand, very, very much worried to see how precisely everything was happening as I had announced. Then, then. Okay. You are. No, you're okay. No, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, you say if I'm not mistaken that the government wants to arrest you yes. in France. Uh, I don't know to what extent you can think about the judicial passing uh, going on, but what are the usual means that the, a country like France has to try to silence you? So, so another another good thing that is actually very bad uh, is uh, what what we call mandat d'arrêt européen. Mandat d'arrêt européen is uh, European arrest warrants are a tool that has been built by the European Union to unify the judicial systems in Europe. And basically, that means that if today you are searched by a, by a judicial system of any country of the European Union for a certain number of crimes, you are automatically, I mean, the, the judiciary system on, on the, of the other countries have to automatically apply the decision without checking upon them. This is really totalitarian. When you when you find yourself in a situation like mine, in which I mean you're being politically persecuted by your country, and you understand that you cannot set foot in any European country with, without for sure being arrested, you you realize that I mean it might sound good at first, but in the diversity of of mankind and of human beings and of states was had actually some advantages no beforehand and. And having to go much further to actually try to find some shelter, I mean, it's kind of uh, embarrassing. So, so I hope I'm not yet in this situation. I hope they won't do that mistake for themselves and for me. Uh, but uh, it's not far. And I mean, they have all kind of means. Uh, yeah, they have all kind of means that go from everything that have detailed to. Uh, yeah, to to I mean the, the overall control they have on the judiciary is of course the most boring. You know, the fact that you ha can have a prosecutor that is so directly and explicitly linked to a political power and is so explicitly obeying to what they're instructing her to do and has so much power is very worrying because I mean for a man of law not to believe anymore in the law of its own system, I mean, on, on, and, and its capacity to abide not by truth, but at least by legality, no, at least by the norms it has itself adopted. One thing is to know for sure that truth is not something that really exists in criminal courts. When you get to criminal court, whether you're a victim or an author, I mean, everything pushes you either to lie, either to hide, either to, you know, to conform yourself as a personage to the in the, in the court system you, you, you are. But another thing is to realize that, I mean, a system can start violating its own rules and that therefore you cannot trust anything inside that system. And that's much, and that makes you much more paranoid. As long as you can play inside a system of rules that you know, at least you have this idea that you can establish a strategy, you can, I mean, you can, you can 
set steps to go somewhere. In the moment, as it has happened in, in Senegal, for example, in which they start distorting that, then, I mean, it's time to fly. It's time to fly because it's useless. And, uh, and, and France is progressively, progressively creating and generating that feeling. I mean, it's going step by step. You don't, you don't destroy what we call an état de droit in a nutshell. And, but this is maybe the worst situation in which you still have many actors that try to abide by the état de droit inside the system and a few who don't, but you don't know who you have in front of you. So, I mean, it's like taking a gamble, no? Like to go and, because maybe you will fall on the good one or maybe not. And if you fall on the good one, but then on, on appeal, not on the good, I mean, and, and, and during all that time, and that's of course part of the idea, no? You're um, obsessed by your own destiny instead of keeping on con contributing to the general good and so forth. And I think that's why uh, Julian Assange ended up having this egotic reputation at the time. He was being attacked from everywhere, anti-Semitic, Russian agent, rapist, so forth, etc. I mean, your natural tendency when you get falsely attacked, I mean, attacked for falsely, uh, falsely attacked is to defend yourself. But so he would, he would spend his whole days defending himself instead of talking about the state of the world, the crimes committed by others and so forth. And that's an excellent technique. And I remember having realized at the time that he was falling into the trap. And, and uh, yeah, five years later, I started myself falling the same trap with, I, I had no excuse. He had the excuse of having no previous example. I had his previous example, but it still was impossible for me to let all these like simple tons of garbage be thrown at me and I would and so I started talking a lot about me <laughs> and of course I saw how people started reproaching me the same thing they were reproaching uh, Julian and how do you escape that trap one of the ways to escape that trap is not to be a dissident and to create organizations so to de-individualize yourself and, and that's often why dissidents often become political opponents and they try to build parties and so forth because they try to expand the... Uh, but what happens is that often, I mean, Julian Assange is a genius. People around with him were not geniuses. So, I mean, if you, if you expand and collectivize, often also what happens is that you dilute your capacity to act and people start to be fearful because no, no one... Not everyone has the capacity to confront the main empire and expose itself to 175 years of prison. So you start having people who want to defend their interests, so they want to be, they want to remain in the organization because they want to have the symbolic plus value this organization triggers, etc. But they don't want to take the risk, so they push you to reduce your message, you reduce your tone, try to uh, to make compromises and so forth, and then you lose your strength. Usman Sonko. He's a miracle, this guy. I don't know how he did this because Usman Sonko started as a dissident. He started, so he's, he's the main leader of the political opposition today in Senegal and by far, I think, the most popular person there. This guy was a civil servant who started by denouncing corruption. So he was a full dissident whistleblower. He got fired from the public service because of that. What did he do very naturally? He, he created a party, a political party. And very soon he was getting such a reach that they tried to destroy him through other means. So they first tried to corrupt him, to, to buy him, to bribe him. And then when they saw nothing was functioning, they accused him of rape. And I don't know the sorcery that happened that in a very conservative country where 95% of the people are Muslim, this did not destroy him, but on the contrary, reinforced him as people not only consider that it was scandalous that they tried to eliminate their candidate through such an infamous accusation, but that in a sense they felt that they were throwing dirt at them by doing so. And so there, March 2021, the first demonstrations, the first killings by the state, because I mean, you've done everything you could non-violently, no? including accusing falsely someone of rape, and you see thousands and hundreds of thousands of people go taking the streets to defend that guy. What is left for you? Either you leave this honor forever, either you shoot at them. And that's what they did, 13 first killed. And so they tried for two years to shoot on those people who were mobilizing themselves. And those people kept on 
kept on mobilizing themselves because it, it became a question of honor for them, not only for him. And this symbiosis between an individual person and a population is something very rare. I, I, there are very few historical examples of this. And it's an example of resistance that needs to be studied, needs to be studied to see how this PASTEF, this, this party, political party that was created seven, eight years ago with no, not much means, has managed to territorially structure itself to actually trigger those mobilizations, make sure people would follow and so forth. I think it's it's critically important to understand what has happened in Senegal from this side for us to learn about these new dynamics, because of course it relies on many new factors like technological limitations and so forth, social networks, etc. So, so yeah, Usman is a is kind of a miracle. So it, it, it he the repression made sixty deaths, thousands of injured, and thousand five hundred political prisoners which is a lot. Uh, in the 80s, in the USSR, there were 600 political prisoners left. So when you reach numbers of 1,000 and more, you're really in the top of the politically uh, authoritarian states. And of course, there were no infrastructures to, to host these people. So they were, as you imagine, detained in, in critical conditions. And, and now they're being liberated block by block by Macky Sall, especially under the pressure of the United States, who I guess are tired of having to host so many refugees from Senegal in, in New York uh, hotels and so forth. I'm sh pretty sure that the local dynamics between Republicans and Democrats are explaining why suddenly the US has given so much interest into Senegalese situation, rather than a humanitarian sudden concern about the state of affairs of the world. And, and, and he has decided to not to exit the prison before all political prisoners are freed before him because he's perfectly conscious of the sacrifice they have done. And he's perfectly conscious that this sacrifice will only have a meaning if it's not for his comfort, but for the overall Senegalese people's interest. And I think that by setting the example like this, I mean, he's nourishing this dynamic of attachment and of defense, which can provide, which can prove to be extremely efficient to actually improve the situation of a country, because if you have such a unity that suddenly emerges in a population, well, you're allowed to trigger important changes uh, of all kinds without using violence, because you have a natural adhesion that can be extremely strong. The only caveat of this is that all these months spent fighting are months spent um, that are not spent to prepare oneself to govern. This is time lost for Senegal, but I think this is something that he will be able to correct. Well, I'm also from Senegal, so you know, you know, I'm sure you have many of us here today, and my name is also Usman, oh. one of uh, Macky Sall's victims here in the US, uh, done jail time here, accused of being a terrorist. And um, there is another German, I don't know if you heard, that's also currently sitting in U.S. jails, accused by Macky Sall of being terrorist. And we were wondering, with all these uh, international warrants, I mean, for myself, I skipped, you know, his uh, track. But there are many of us, as you know, Senegalese activists around the world. What can these uh, international arrest warrants really have as an effect? from Macky Sall, because I didn't see them being um, followed by many states, but the US, they have arrested a German who is currently in jail <coughs> and uh, actually being worked on by the young lady that previously questioned you. She's doing a lot of the paperwork and he's soon being tried. So what can we do? Well, so as you might know, I asked myself my question because I, I was granted an international arrest warrant by Senegal. and. The only solution I found was, but that was a very specific situation. I, I was targeted first by French government. So French government, fr French Foreign Affairs Ministry filed a, co a criminal complaint against me for having revealed that uh, French Secret Services agents had participated in the repression of the demonstrations in Senegal. Two days later, the prosecutor of Dakar issued an international arrest warrant against me 
more broadly for having uh, uh, basically filed a complaint against the ICC. That's basically what they were reproaching me. Uh, of course, it was coordinated. So I was in a situation in which I was seeing the Julian Assange trap repeat itself. No, so basically they would arrest me in any border or whatever. And so I used techniques that I learned with Julian, and to get to Senegal and to tell them, "You want me? I'm here. Now, what what are you going to do?" Uh, what I noticed is that visibly the arrest warrant hadn't been issued, on, on, unlike what had been announced. Because I was able, I mean, I was able to test through identities if, I mean, if basically I was being searched for through an Interpol uh, warrant, it wasn't the case. And uh, I was only arrested, I mean, I flew, as you know, from, from Senegal, I, I reached Mauritania. I mean, I flew, no, I, I took a boat. And, uh, and, and I was only arrested by secret services under French uh, I mean, I mean, French gave them the information to arrest me near the capital in uh, and brought back to Senegal where they put me in prison. And I was saved only by the social pressure that I immediately emerged from the fact that, that I had been arrested. I, th I think there were like 25,000 signatories in the petition the first day of my arrest. But more importantly, apparatus of power like Agence France Presse, AFP, the equivalent of Reuters and Associated Press for France, and my my bar who had, were complaining very strongly, and it was getting amplified by every day. So again, law depends on what support you have and what power socially you have, and law will be applied to you or not, depending on that factor and simply on that factor. So. Regarding the efficiency of these international arrest warrants, I mean, I'm sure that if you bring the case to the senators who have been very implicated in this circumstance, it might be very much helpful to influence the prosecutors whom have decided to actually apply these uh, uh, this, uh, this mandates. That's basically what I, what, what I would be able to say. But it's a bit like when I'm being convoked to be arrested. It, I mean... It's weird, no? Like, uh, if you if you are from a from another social background, I guess you're not convoked to be arrested. You're arrested. I mean, they come to your house, they arrest you, and that's all, no? And now they're giving me a date, and I know everything is like completely, I mean, yeah, dystopian, no? So, so it all depends basically on on, on that. Okay. So at Assange, I, I was listening to NPR a few days ago. Looks like Assange is fighting right now. He's fighting for his extradition to US. And at the same time, a lot of journalists are being killed at the right now. And also, recently, one of our most prominent journalists from Senegal, Papa Adrian, was killed. So this, what is the future of journalism? Because I'm afraid that those people in power are going to use then you can silence journalists and in case all those prominent journalists are silent, what will be the future of journalism? Those journalists are right now I, I think the smartest and most powerful will be smarter than, I mean, they, they will just buy journalists, you know, which is the most efficient way to actually protect yourself and orientate the mainstream media. In France, 90% of the mainstream media are, is owned by eight people. These are all billionaires who have a direct dependency on states to actually make and nurture their fortunes, hence the circular system I was describing further. I mean, I mean, arresting journalists and is really a last solution for weak powers. It's either for powers who have not much resources, either in some cases, uh, when you're confronted to such a resistant, rebellious person like Julian Assange, and that leaves you no other choice than actually use force because he doesn't care about money and so forth. But in general, systems of power are sufficiently structured and, and, um, and dominant so that they don't fear individualities. Julian Assange was a very specific case because he was not only a journalist, but he had this technological capacity that allowed him to protect his sources in a very novel way and thus presented a systemic, systemic risk. I mean, he's a guy who, when he was 16 years old, was hacking the Pentagon. So you can imagine the, the level of threat that he could represent to, 
to current to current powers. So in that sense, I'm, I'm not sure he, he can be used as an example of um, what will happen more generally. And I don't agree at all with the line of defense that is currently used, which is trying to assimilate him to a normal journalism journalist to create to to try to create sorry to try to create a, yeah to tr to try to frighten other journalists and bring them to support him. I think no journalist for as, as much ego as he can have will ever identify himself with Julian, who has published more scoops than all the mainstream media ever like in their history in the world like alone so i mean I, they will never identify to him they, they consider him a specific thing weird they don't like him of course they don't like him because he steals their business their business is intermediation and he comes and delivers it for free to everyone so of course he takes out the value that they can produce from a purely capitalistic perspective so Yes, when you have a, a country that arrests journalists, so it's a bad sign for them in general, no? rather than for society. When they start to systematically arrest them, it can be a good compens compensation way to the fact they don't have enough money to actually buy them. And that, that yeah, that, that's, where it become, that, that's where it becomes bad. But when you're in an intermediate situation like Senegal, in which from time to time you have Papa Dignan who gets arrested, sometimes another, but very briefly, I think it's a very good sign. It's a very good sign because it, it, there, it shows a lack of control, a very strong lack of control. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, you mentioned something interesting earlier about being the perfect holder of this. So if you are uh, an activist or a decent or uh, somebody who's standing for certain truth for society, but you may be sometimes the perpetrator of the system. How do you avoid that? How do you avoid the trap of where you are actually standing for good for the people? And then sometimes later you become the perpetrator of that system you are fighting. It's a very complex question because, I mean, for, first, there is no like general answer. And I think it's uh, it's very difficult. I mean, we all keep on making mistakes no we all keep i mean we all learn and discover more things along the way one of the key elements for me is to remain as close as possible to the bodies it means i mean what, what you actually feel and suffer from is what you should fight for the more you distance yourself from a subject the more distortions there might be along the way and the more you might be manipulated so i mean as close as you can get to your own experience to what you have lived through um, the fair you you might be afterwards, you know, it doesn't mean. I mean but then, of course, you need to have an al analytical thinking about yourself. I mean, Hitler, who did not manage to become a painter, may, might have thought more about why he didn't manage to be a painter rather than thinking that it was the Jewish merchants who actually and uh, made him like uh, barred him from being a painter. So, of course, if you're neurotic or locked into, it might it might go bad, but. Trying to yeah start from from what you see and feel, I think it's it's critical. Otherwise, uh, otherwise again you you can get manipulated. So yeah, that and working within yourself, not to be dependent on on rage, on hatred, on on your own injuries, and not not to act upon injuries alone. That was very basic. I don't know if the answer was good. Um, and I'm actually going to speak to you about this later, but because you mentioned it, we can just go ahead and uh, I'll run through it. Um, so in his case, um, he can be an activist who is only established here, had a family here. So fighting for his case was much easier, I would say. What I did was, like you said, I did contact my senators, I contacted journalists like Van Alignan to come to the U.S. and get the on his behalf. And also uh, journalists who were in exile like Adam Gay and other activists. Uh, however, in this case, the case of Suri Sayyafad, he's a migrant who went through Nicaragua uh, to get to the U.S. Now, what they did was they launched a red notice uh, through a poll to get him arrested, but he's in detention right now in Pennsylvania in an immigration detention center. Now, he will be trialed in New Jersey uh, in April, and they want to have him deported. Now, we all know the conditions back home. Now, his case is slightly different because he's being accused of being one of the seven people who burned and bugged and allegedly killed two young ladies. 
I would say allegedly because not one journalist saw these bodies being removed from the bus. Now, when this first happened, you could see, um, we didn't see no police scientific police. There was nobody collecting evidence. People, journalists were able to go in and out of the bus while it is still smoking to take pictures and videos. The interior minister, Antoine John, was at the scene within 10 minutes. And they want us to believe that two people were killed from that bus. Uh, I hope that that didn't actually happen. But that being said, wouldn't you say that that scene was already contaminated, even if there was a crime that was committed? No, I, have no, no I remember perfectly well this event, which was meant to be because of a cocktail Molotov being sent to the bus, yes. uh, which is an accusation that they have, I mean, the power has tried to, to impose on, 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 on demonstrators to, to try to delegitimize them by showing that they use force and that they present a threat to the public. Uh, I remember also that it was very opportunely, opportunely brought at a moment in which they were finding no evidence to sustain that claim, that more general claim. Uh, to consider that you cannot trust the current power to actually offer a fair trial and proceedings to this person is, of course, self-evident. So um, in that circumstance, things, uh, that circumstances should suffice to bar any kind of extradition. I mean, that's one of the criteria for extradition processes. Um, I don't know if he asked for refugee status when he got into the US. Was it denied or not yet? Actually, uh, when he came in, immediately he asked for asylum and he told him that he was being persecuted by the government of Senegal. Ten days after he was admitted to the US, his wife was interrogated back home, intimidated into uh, giving them his vocation. And uh, so ICE called him for an ICE check-in, and that's why he was arrested. Okay, so we don't know what's his refugee demand status. No, it's still pending, and actually that would be one of the things the judge will address in yep. April. I don't want to give out the date, but we do have a date. So more general, I mean, you have to, I mean, like socializing the knowledge of what is happening in Senegal, and because which is still perceived as a democratic country by many, including judges, prosecutors, and so forth, is critical, you know? Making them know what is happening is, is essential. Then, of course, trying to trigger a political change as soon as possible in Senegal before, before these scandals happen, I mean, has to be combined with legal action here by civil organizations to actually have him defend his rights. I mean, that's only everything, I mean, that's, that's what you can decide. And if the worst case is extradited, we can hope that the Senegalese regime will, in any case, not last long enough for him to face any other consequence than uh, some time in jail, preventive jail. Uh -huh. But we can see that, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe people died, maybe he did it and so forth, but maybe also, maybe also this is just about the power trying to find a scapegoat for his systematic repression against pacific demonstrators. And I think there's a strong case without knowing the evidence in the case to actually hint at that direction. So, I mean, that's a clear case in which normally jurisdictions should be very careful about the decisions they're taking because they're playing with the lives of, of people who are clearly exposed. And, and not only because of that, but because also they might become complicit of a, an attempt to whitewash a political regime to escape goats for sitting. Thank you, Ms. Assange. Um, obviously, finding it to follow this close as yourself, but there were always, whenever President Obama was asked by a member of the press, why can't you engage in some sort of uh, pardon as such? And his answer was always the same. He said that he hasn't been trialed in the West on crime, was up in the public in court. And there obviously has been perhaps some discussion over if Julian Assange had obviously handed himself over to the authorities, obviously being extradited to the US, there would have been perhaps another ground to obviously then appeal and then at least try and um, get him out of his predicament. The, the current state of affairs is that obviously he's currently sitting in London jail. It's, I don't know what perhaps your outlook is, first of all, on, on what that will, will entail. It, obviously, it will be by the end of the week, perhaps maybe a uh, not included the matter, but in the likes of Chelsea Manning, for example, she obviously got a presidential 
My question is, do you think he did the right strategy to essentially try and outrun the criminal uh, case to essentially inevitably end up in the same position mm. and that if he had him solo was 10 years ago, there would have been perhaps another avenue to appeal and he would be in a different predicament? I think Julian has been one of the most ill-advised people in the world from his legal team to start with. I mean, working with him allowed me to discover how how lawyers lack of political sense in an almost criminal manner. They really don't understand the thing about how politics work and how the, the, the systems they're participating in are entailed into political considerations and so forth. So I'm pretty sure much things could have been done differently and probably better. Was the rape accusation fully fabricated from the beginning or instrumentalized in order to have him neutralized without the US having to assume the fact they were politically persecuting him? The question is still open, even I think for himself. Uh, there are various factors that could explain what has happened. Was flying out of Sweden the right decision? I mean, you have to go back to the beginning of the case to understand what happened. We're in August 2020. Julian is in Sweden as he's touring around the world, spending a few days every in every city to actually try to promote what he's doing and find partners, local partners, that will get access to the documents he has and publicize them. It's not yet the Julian Assange we know that gives direct full access to the citizens. He's still using local partners to disseminate this information in between other reasons to try to gather uh, notoriety for WikiLeaks. So he's in Sweden. He stays at some 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 woman place who happens to be a former cultural attaché of the Swedish embassy in Cuba, whatever that might hint at. I mean, I have my idea, but whatever. And then he stays at a friend's house and he happens to have a sexual relationship with one and the other. Uh, a second, according to their description of facts, the second realizes that he had sex with the first one a few days before, and it was unprotected sex at some point with both. So you could have a very genuine explanation, which is either some kind of jealousy that happens, I mean, of feeling of betrayal, like you actually made me feel special, but you are not, or simply an actual genuine willingness to protect themselves from a behavior that might be dangerous for them. They start discussing, and uh, I mean, this is according to, to them, huh? we don't know. And uh, at some point, for a very weird reason, the former cultural attaché in Cuba, of Swedish embassy, suggests her friend to go to the police station in the weird idea that by going to the police station, they would be able to force him to do a, a test. Like to see if he has any kind of a, okay. They get there and the police tells them the only, this is according to them, the, the only way to have him forced to make a test, <laughs> that's where it becomes very weird and comical, is to accuse him of rape, which they do, which they do. So Julian, Imagine, no, you've started divulgating most important secrets in the world. Everyone knows that you have much more secrets with yourself. He has behaved. Maybe we could tell him you should have maybe been a bit more careful at that time. Finds himself in this situation, so he immediately goes to the police station and I mean and tells them whatever you need, I'm here, blah, blah, blah. In a few days, the case is dropped because there was nothing. And he asks if he can leave the country. And he formally asks, he goes to, can I leave? And they say, yeah, no problem. He leaves the next day, there's an arrest warrant against him. So what is the genuine part of all this? 
and what is the instrumentalization of all this? What I know is that when you find yourself in such a situation, they will make sure that any decision you take is the wrong one. You know, either you stay and you stay landlocked for how, how long, what, I mean, it made no sense for him to stay. Either you leave just to keep on doing your life. And, and so then I could continue. The whole thing is completely crazy in the, in the UK. Again, they arrest him. He gets freed on bail. And he, they, I mean, they put him on jail and he gets freed on jail, paying a fortune. He's in a mansion, blah, blah. And at some point he understands that they're going to arrest him. And he goes to the Ecuadorian embassy in London, which was not a luxury. Huh? It's a ground floor, 150 square meters uh, embassy with 10 people working on it. So he barely had 20 square meters for nine years uh, there. And he had no access to courtyards, to the sun or anything. It was really torture uh, during that time. And he had to leave all this time being accused of rape. And as you know, journalists and even people don't care about what actually happened. Rape is so big for itself, it, that's the only thing that counts, knowing if what happened. Where, in any case, people will say, well, we cannot know, you know, so like, uh, whatever. So he's, and so I, I spent from 2014, 2019, every time I would speak with a journalist, whatever Julian did was, yeah, but he's a rapist, no? And yeah, but what about the rape case? Yeah, but, you know, like, and, and this, this all happens in such a calendar that, I mean, you can only hint at the fact that the proceedings are being politically orientated, especially when they last for nine years, you know, for nine years dragged into a preliminary investigation, no judgment, no anything. So, yeah, so along that path, he did, I don't know how many mistakes, some that infuri infuriated us, most of them because he was ill-advised. And one of them, which was maybe the saddest, for me, because it was because of me, was when in December 2017. So, as you know, as I told you, no, the CIA had launched its operation more or less in February. And visibly, they had decided for a twofold operation, which was like get him out of the embassy with by negotiating an agreement with a new president, Lenin Moreno of Ecuador, in which they would grant him an IMF. Uh, grants in exchange of a few things, including the fact that he would expel Julian Assange from the embassy. So they were wanting to expel him and, and, and thus arrest him, put him into a prison in the UK, bet on the fact that his lawyers would appeal and appeal and appeal so that the process would drag, be dragged for years and that during all this time, Julian Assange would be in an anti-terrorist prison, completely inactivated. And without and for the, with the U.S. not having to face any cost of having to judge him, because I don't think that either Trump or Biden want an Assange trial under their term. So, I mean, this was the ideal situation, the limbo. And of course, how not to fall on the trap, how not to appeal and appeal and appeal when you know that you're facing 175 years in a uh, high security prison in the U.S. So they did that. and. Uh, and I mean, so we were heading towards there and we were feeling it by a lot of things around us, which were very weird. So he convoked me in December, 2017 to the embassy. And he, he, he brought me to the, to the toilets and we sat on the floor of the toilets and he, he started whispering with me and, and his wife. And I was like, okay, he's gone mad. That's over, no, like, uh, yeah, they, they destroyed him. I'm telling him, no, no, we, we, are, we can only speak here, blah, blah. And he explained to me that he had a diplomatic passport that was provided to him that would last not for long, probably. And so that he didn't know what to do, that there was this all these elements showing that he might be extradited from any moment. And basically the question was, should he exit or not? And I was very much for the exiting solution. I was very much for taking the risk. He has the diplomatic passport, so if he gets arrested, it's a, it's a very, it's a mess to actually justify that. Blah blah blah. You exit. You take the risk of being arrested. By chance, the people are not are sleeping during their shift or whatever, and you are on the embassy, and you you get. I mean, you get to get to somewhere else. So I told him that, but I was. 28, and it was not 
I mean, it was not my life which was at stake. So I, I couldn't push him. I, I couldn't even actually share how intensely I felt that he needed to escape now or ever, because it was now or never. And so I just told him that I thought he should leave. And I didn't insist. And I think a man in this situation, he really needs to be insisted on. Because the stakes are so high. And what he's facing is so immense that if you're not surrounded by people that tell you, OK, go for it, man. It's now or never. Go, 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 go. You won't move. We, you will choose the, I mean, you, if you have a chance to remain in freedom for one month, one year, maybe a decade more in the embassy, rather than spend it in an anti-terrorist prison or high security prison, intuitively, your mind will tell you, okay, take that wait, no, like don't, don't, don't expose yourself to making a mistake. And so he didn't, he didn't leave. And uh, his pass diplomatic passport was canceled like three hours after. And, uh, and yeah, a few months later, he was expelled from the embassy and, uh, and sent to, to prison. And he's been there for four years. So, I mean, yeah, biggest mistake of my life by far, by far. And because not only for Julian, of course, for Julian, but I mean, it might sound weird to say that, but for the world, imagine Julian Assange and WikiLeaks active during the COVID crisis, during the Ukraine war, during all these years. I mean, how this world might have been different. And that's, and that's where you realize, I mean, I come from a, a, a school of thought which tries not to give much importance to individuals for many reasons, including ethical ones. We, we've, I, I've been taught to think structurally. You know, structures generate facts, actors, events, almost the Hegelian perspective. Know that history plays with individuals. but And, and people like Julian Assange have taught me that well, individuals are very important and need to be protected. When you have such exceptional people like them, I mean, these are people who can change lives by millions. And what happens to them? And actually, our enemies have understood it very well. That's why they kill. That's why they arrest. That's why they, that's why they put so much effort on destroying individually their enemies. Because they know how important someone who has, had, who has gone through a certain path who has accumulated some certain experience, thoughts, talents, I mean, might basically change history. So yeah, that would be my answer on, on Julian's and our mistakes. Sorry? I guess the subject has We'll, we'll, we'll come back to, I mean, it, it will all be decided in the Oval Office. It's whether Biden wants a trial, doesn't want a trial. And that, that I mean, I guess it has gone already through the Oval Office and that the UK judges have their instructions. So I guess that the smartest solution for them would be to accept this appeal from Julian. I mean, this is an, was an interlocutory proceeding that is meant to decide whether Julian can have a right to appeal or not his extradition. So the decision that will be given by the court will determine if he can appeal or not. If he can appeal, well, they drag it for a, long, a year longer. And that's, I think, better for Biden. And I think that's better for the US. And I mean, that's the ideal solution because it also allows them to pretend that they're respecting the rules of law, that they're actually considering his situation. And yeah, it's another year of Julian Assange in prison. And maybe a year and a year and a year end up destroying the man so violently that he will be completely unable to operate once he's out. And then maybe they will consider freeing him because he will no longer be a threat. And because the uh, they will want to appear human at that stage. I mean, there were only, yeah, I think there are so many million people that know who Julian Assange 
and yet there were a hundred people in front of the of the of the court in the in London that day. That's the best way to to let someone be destroyed. It's not to make the powerful feel that they're taking a risk by destroying him. And that's the biggest, yeah, that's the that's the biggest fear any dissident should have. And also the he should be conscious of that. A dissident, unlike a political opponent, will probably find himself alone and thus saved only by a political actor, a state actor that will try to protect him. But otherwise, his fate is doomed structurally. Maybe a last question. Thank you, sir. Thank you for everything you're doing for my country, for my freedom. It's not so good. It's a honor to be here. I think my sister only asked my question, but I will leave a question. So, yesterday, I was watching anybody here. He said, when you went to the office of Mumu's sake, the guy was ashamed, you don't have the courage to watch him in the eyes in front of two men, but he was turning his back. He's so bitter to talk with him. That guy, he jailed more than the house of people. He's in jail right now. Everybody who comes in his office, man out there for six months, one day. They tell him, they told him, man out there for, he be ending doing one year and something. Okay. One day, you will go. No, nothing. You just judge you, they don't do nothing. For those people who prosper people like him, like for those officials, those gender, most brutalized people, put them in jail. What's the difference of them after? What's the difference of these people? Because they were so many people. Okay. Some people that got their memory, their wife asked for a divorce, some their kids not going to school, some lost their parents. They don't have even the chance to go take them to jail. It's so painful, it's so hurt. Okay. Those people who make it easy for myself to brutalize these people, to do this genocide in Senegal, killing people, for those people who let the natives with their pickup, with their car, doing their pushing, sorry for that, doing this, this kind of shit, and nothing happened. Let people of Senegal, more than millions of people, taking the sea, losing their life, like Papadoka, people of Nicaragua. Anything happened, he's so painful for those people who make it easy for himself. What is the fate for them after? What's gonna happen? Yeah, I know I know this guy kind of well because he's the one who sent me to prison. So uh, he, he's basically the, the instructing judge that is systematically used to uh, to 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 send political opponents to, to pre they have one privileged one because they know he will abide by the the the, the, the instructions given by the government. Which is not the case of all the judges. So I mean, they prefer playing playing it fair and and, and yeah, and, and and conservative. So um, I had a, a good discussion about that with with uh, Usman Sonko. So very probably the next president of Senegal. And we were I I did because my international I, I did I I filed a complaint at the International Criminal Court on what was happening on Senegal, but I didn't do it in coordination with, with Usman Sonko. He actually discovered it with everyone. Mm -hmm. And and he, so we, we would be speaking like every day like at that time. Uh, and so I remember he started laughing when, when he told me, what have you been doing without telling me all this time? <laughs> and, and then he started going through everyone, every, every, every suspect that had uh, targeted and so forth. And one of the remarks, I mean, he he was really it's interesting because he was really careful of not trying to influence me or whatever. But he told me one of the remarks he told made was you have not put any judge there. And I was I was like telling him, yeah, it's kind of a calculus because I don't want to, you know, to to radicalize them before before something happens. I want to the reality, I mean, that was partly true. The reality is that we had to, I had to 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 produce a systematic analysis of all the structures of power of Senegal in basically three weeks. So I didn't have time to actually, and sources to actually get into the judiciary. And he was, but he reacted saying, no, 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 no. Judicial actors have been critical in the organization of this repression. They should not be forgotten. And it is true that in most of political transitions from a dictatorship to a liberal democracy, judges are protected 
including in, in Germany after the Second World War, for simple reasons, because there are technicians and it's very difficult to actually replace technicians. It takes time, you have to, and if you replace them, you also have to replace those who form them, you know, and you find yourself with a vacuum. So you, you keep, you, you kind of tendentiously prefer the comfortable um, solution, which is basically to maintain people in power and just have them obey you as they obeyed the previous ones. So this is not the perspective of Usman, at least when we talked about it last year. Of course, now we, everything can change. I mean, I'm, I don't want to implicate myself in, in what is happening now because I want to maintain my independence from there and because I consider it's a Senegalese question that has to be solved by Senegalese. But Usman was very clear on the fact that impunity should not remain for, for these people. And I think Mr. Sek is quite aware of what is happening. And because just to give you an example, he's a guy who's very fancy. When I met him, he has nice watches, nice Western costume, not something you can pay yourself uh, with Senegalese salaries normally, no? So he, he, and he tends to be very precautious on how he presents himself, no? There's something very obsessive with him and how people perceive him. And last week, um, when they started freeing political prisoners, a member of the registrar, who was also a member of PASTEF, of the registry, sorry, came, was, was in exile in Mali, and he decided to come back to, 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 to Dakar. He basically offered himself saying, there's an arrest warrant against me, here I am, thinking that he would be not arrested because they were freeing everyone else. They decided to arrest him. And he was presented to that judge. The prosecutor, which is, of course, directly obeying to the instructions of the government, did not require him to be sent to jail. So basically, they wanted him free like everyone else, only with a judicial control with some obligations which are not to be respected in the case. Mamadou Sek, he was seeing by hundreds all the people he had sent to prison being freed by the dozen every day. So he was basically understanding that maybe all these politicians he had obeyed to were had played on him and he basically was over. I mean, they're all negotiating their amnesty and so forth. And he was understanding that he would not be part of that. So he freaked out and decided to send to jail this guy who was a member of the registry. So you had all the registrars of Dakar who came to his office to try to block his transferring to prison. And he kept on saying, no, I will send him to jail because he, wanted, he, was, he was like the last Mohican trying to, to stand by his power and to apply his power like against everything. Even Basically, even if the world would, would fall, he would keep on sending to jail those political prisoners because otherwise, if he stopped doing, he would just admit that he had been since the beginning strictly obeying political orders. So in a weird twist, and that's what happens in general in those circumstances, he decided that the only way to defend himself in the years to come from having been a political actor was to put this guy in jail when he was being asked to be freed. This is when you smell the end. This is when something is finishing for you and you are going to pass from having nice watches and nice uh, dresses to, to, to just either, either go to jail or just have your life finished in a way or another. There are thousands of families that have been wrecked by this person, and he knows that, and he knows that, and I think that weights a lot in this circumstance, and I think he must be asking himself, why has he done that mistake, and was it worth it? And I hope, I hope he will have to ask himself that question for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> not.